Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's Jitterbit webinar. Over the next 45 minutes or so, we will be taking a look at using Jitterbit to connect to the cloud. My name is Dan Oxenberg, and I head up the marketing here at Jitterbit. Also with me is Dave Gordon, and Dave is our Director of Sales Engineering. Dave is going to give us a hands-on demo of Jitterbit today, but before we jump right into the product, I am going to give a brief overview of what we're all about here at Jitterbit, as well as share some of the common pitfalls uh, to look out for when adopting cloud as part of your business and IT strategy. So a couple of housekeeping uh, items before we get started. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them using the box on the right side of your screen, and we will get to as many of them as we can following Dave's demo. Uh, I can see we have a big turnout here today, so I suspect we'll have quite a few questions. So let me start by answering the first and most common one. And uh, the answer to that is yes, uh, today's webinar will be recorded. And we will send you uh, a link to that a little later this week. So let's get started. So who and what is Jitterbit? Well, we are an application and data integration software vendor. We develop and sell an off-the-shelf solution for connecting any combination of applications, databases, or systems, whether they live on-premise or in the cloud. So there are a handful of companies out there that um, claim to do integration, um, and where we differ is that our focus is on simplifying otherwise complex integration processes. So to be clear, we aren't trying to solve easy integration. What we're trying to do is deliver software that can address the most complicated and deep of integration challenges, but abstract the complexity from those processes so that we can provide integration solutions um, into the hands of people that don't have coding expertise. And as a wonderful side effect of these uh, features, we lower the cost and shorten the implementation time for integration projects. So Jitterbit has been in development for over a decade and we began marketing the product in 2006. So we've got quite a few years of experience under our belt and uh, as a result a lot of great customers as well. So Jitterbit is available on our website um, in both an on-premise and cloud trial. And one of the great results of making it this easy to get started is that we've been able to um, make a lot of people successful. So you can see some of our customers um, are listed here. Um, we're very proud of all of them. Um, we've got some great companies such as CA, LexisNexis, and uh, Continental Airlines. But the interesting point really in this slide is the breadth of industries in which Jitterbit has made organizations successful. Integration is a horizontal need. Yeah, the technical requirements and business processes differ uh, between verticals, but at its core, the need for integration is a very similar and universal need. So I will get into uh, how the architecture of Jitterbit works in just a bit, but at a high level, the product is designed to provide native connectivity to just about any standards-based system. So this means we can pull in any web service, connect to any type of EDI, such as HL7, databases, etc., uh, and as a result, um, we are able to help organizations across industries, whether that's telecom, um, federal agencies, we've got NASA listed here, um, healthcare, we've got McKesson listed here. Um, so I'm not going to go into every vertical, um, or we could be here all day, but the point is that no matter what your integration needs, uh, chances are Jitterbit is going to be able to help you. So the interesting thing about our customers, and this is a trend that has truly picked up in the last two years, is the fact that about 65% of those using Jitterbit connect to some sort of cloud-based system and share that data with their existing infrastructure. So we have customers that are connecting a single SaaS application, uh, for example Salesforce, to an otherwise fully on-premise infrastructure. Then we also have customers who are running their entire business in the cloud um, using uh, for example, Amazon EC2. And then we have other customers who are deploying Jitterbit in more of a virtual environment for use in their own private cloud. 
So the fact that the number of cloud-related integrations continues to grow is is for occurring for a pretty obvious reason. Um, and you know, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through every possible anal analyst prediction here. Um, you know, as they say, everyone's got an opinion, which is like a you-know-what, and uh, depending on how you define your market, whether you're talking about platform as a service, or software as a service, or infrastructure as a service, and whether you're including private and public clouds, the market for cloud is predicted to grow incredibly rapidly over the next five years. Um, and I'm sure I don't need to share a lot of these numbers um, with you. Everyone who's here is here for a webinar on cloud integration, which means you've moved beyond the why should I choose cloud and moved into the stage of how exactly do I implement cloud. And so that is a good question. Yeah, cloud can be a great strategy, but it also creates some real problems, um, especially when you're trying to link it with your overall business strategy and IT infrastructure. So even adding just one public cloud means you've now got data beyond your firewall, and this data likely needs to work and share um, processes and its own data with other enterprise systems. So now what we're doing is we're really living in this sort of hybrid infrastructure where the reality is that you may have data living in a combination of places, in public and private clouds, as well as in traditional in-house systems. So how do you connect all of these systems? Well, you've got a few options when it comes to integration, and one that a lot of companies initially turn to is just coding the whole thing in-house. They've got a bunch of talented developers who know their systems, so the question is why not just let them figure it out? Well, there are a number of pitfalls when it comes to this, this approach. Um, for one, uh, you're putting the burden on IT to not only create the integration, but to manage it from that day forward. And the integration that they're going to code is likely very system specific. So you're basically coding, how do I move data from point A to point B? So when you need to start adding more systems, you're going to need to start coding more integrations. And as you do this, you're very quickly going to end up with spaghetti code that's very unmanageable. And probably you'll end up looking a little bit like this baby in the slide. Another option is an appliance or adapter-based technology. These types of systems promise to provide easy maintenance, ease of use, but they also have their own issues. For one, you're purchasing a license that will either lock you into uh, an appliance or a given set of adapters or endpoints, depending on what the vendor's model is. Um, another problem is they usually have very rigid deployment options. So you're either tied down to this black box living uh, in your infrastructure, or you're tied to this public multi-tenant cloud. Um, and the problem with this is it's very hard to deploy your integration solution where it makes the most sense within your own strategy and infrastructure. And then finally, scaling these types of solutions because of their pricing model, um, is not only difficult but can make cost balloon out of control pretty quickly. The final option, and by far the best one, is a flexible off-the-shelf solution like Jitterbit. Jitterbit offers a fully graphical, no coding configuration environment, and we have native connectivity to over 250 different systems out of the box. And again, this is not adapters, this is all based on loosely coupled connectivity, which I'll get into in just a little bit. But at its core, Jitterbit is a graphical tool designed for non-technical users. And what this means is that it's very realistic for someone from line of business to use Jitterbit to solve an integration need. Now, I know there are more than a few IT folks in the audience who right now are probably sitting at their desk cringing at the thought of letting someone from the business side run wild on integration. But as I mentioned previously, first and foremost, Jitterbit is designed to abstract complexity. So we're not going to prevent you from getting your hands dirty if that's what you're really looking for, but we're always going to try to make the hard stuff easier. And then the final point here is that Jitterbit is designed to be a set and forget it system. So what that means is it requires very little maintenance and um, as a result fewer resources needed to manage it. And in fact, a majority of our customers have a single person responsible for Jitterbit. And so obviously, for your organization, this would mean a lower total cost of ownership than any other solution out there. 
So I talked briefly about some of the solution-specific pitfalls when it comes to coding and adapter-based solutions, but it doesn't really stop there. Um, when it comes to cloud, you're also presented with some unique hurdles that are important to understand before you dive in. One of these obstacles is related to the rapid innovation that cloud can allow. And this is a little more specific to SaaS applications and multi-tenancy, but one of the great benefits is that uh, vendors are able to quickly roll out application enhancements and updates to a broad range of customers and users. The side effect of this model is that it also means rapidly changing APIs because as the cloud application changes, so too does the way in which you access it. In fact, looking at the public cloud and vendors such as uh, NetSuite or Salesforce, most providers update their API at least four times a year. So imagine what this means for an integration that has hard-coded connectivity, whether you built that in-house or you're doing it through an adapter-based technology. Um, you're looking at that integration potentially breaking and needing attention every few months, and that's just for one single cloud application. If you start throwing a few in the mix, suddenly you're trying to keep track of multiple release schedules and multiple changes to APIs um, throughout the year. Another thing to consider is the fact that cloud is inherently a network dependent uh, entity, obviously. Um, so even the best networks have downtimes. So how does your integration solution deal with this? Um, you need to ensure that all the data is delivered and synchronized between the systems, even if there is a gap in accessibility for a brief time. You also need to figure out how do you log these errors and how do you alert the correct people so that they can make sure everything picked up where it left off. Um, this might sound like an obvious requirement, but actually executing takes some planning. And then finally, the point here in the last point is performance. So this hurdle ties back into the API issue a little bit. Um, when it comes to cloud, most systems offer their APIs via web services. And these web services all come with their own unique nuances and personalities. So just to name a few examples, some web services have call restrictions meaning you can only call them so many times, um, per minute, per hour, etc. You've also got size limitations. So maybe a web service, will, web service will say you can only move 250 records per call. Um, and then again, every web service is going to have a different structure, and it may be using SOAP or REST as its standard. So the point here is that a system that doesn't address these issues um, is at the very best going to be inefficient, and at worst basically come to a crashing halt when you're talking about higher volumes of data. So you're going to see some of how we deal with this in our demo in just a bit, but at a high level here's a few ways in which Jitterbit uh, addresses these cloud nuances. First we offer loosely coupled connectivity and so what this means is we don't deal in adapters. We don't hard code connectivity to a specific version of a specific product. Instead, what we do is we provide native connectivity to standards-based systems. So what this means is any web service, any, da any database, ODBC, JDBC, flat files, any EDI file, etc., that we can pull in, we can connect to. This is the key when it comes to cloud because it means we can pull in any web service that you throw at Jitterbit. And what this also means then is that if the structure of an API changes, Jitterbit can automatically update itself to work with a new API. So as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, our goal is to simplify complex integration processes. And the key to this is the elimination of coding. So Jitterbit offers a fully graphical experience, and what this means, as I mentioned briefly before, is that a technical business analyst is able to use Jitterbit. Uh, this user is someone that understands the systems that they are trying to connect to, and also knows how the underlying data should interact. But this user also wouldn't know what a line of Java code was if you put it in front of them. At the same time, we also want to ensure that the system offers enough depth so that an IT user who wants to get into the code and add additional functionality can do so. Um, and they do that through our plugin architecture. So this is particularly useful for IT departments that are looking to build out a private cloud that uses specific standards and structures that the organization itself has put in place. And then finally listed here is reusability. And we offer this through something we call jitter packs. 
And jitter packs are essentially integration templates that can include all or part of a full integration process. This includes definitions of source and target systems, data mappings, transformations, etc. Um, jitter packs are important for two things. They provide a jump start for common cloud integrations, and they also provide a way to share integrations between deployed instances of Jitterbit, whether those live internally, uh, between departments, between partners, or between on-premise and the cloud. Speaking of deployment, Jitterbit's flexible deploy anywhere design is another feature that sets it apart. So when I say this, I'm talking about not only can Jitterbit connect anything to anything, but you also have the integration processes running on a server wherever you want. So you're not locked into an appliance, you're not running on a public server farm. Um, it can be installed anywhere and in any combination. So we have customers running it on-premise to connect their on-premise systems with a few cloud systems. Other customers have all or a majority of their infrastructure in the cloud. So Jitterbit is running on an instance of Amazon EC2, or in some cases Rackspace. Um, then others have a private cloud, so they're running Jitterbit in more of a virtual environment. And the point here is that you can run Jitterbit in multiple locations, and uh, you can have the systems working in tandem together to um, finalize integration processes, or they can run in separate areas, running different integrations for different systems. So it's very flexible. So I've talked a lot about the various strategies and product features involved in a successful cloud integration, but what are the real-world implications of choosing the right cloud integration solution? Uh, to talk a little bit about this, I want to go through a quick case study on one of our customers. In this case, uh, it's AWPRX, and they are affiliated with 95% of the nation's pharmacies. And what they do is they help workers' compensation beneficiaries fill prescriptions and manage claims online. The company also manages those prescriptions on behalf of insurance carriers and third-party administrators. So as you can imagine, data processing, storage, and readily available access to all of this data is critical to their success. Previously, AWPRX used a complex homegrown Java and Oracle-based solution to run their pharmacy benefit management services. They were also using cast iron for their integration needs, but that was proving too complicated and constantly needed uh, new code to be written in order to keep it running. So AWPRX came to us to help them move a lot of this data into Salesforce and onto the custom applications that they plan to build on the force.com cloud. So using Jitterbit, they completed this process and had their on-premise Oracle database feeding a lot of this data into their cloud applications living on force.com. But when they saw how powerful it could be to run their business in the cloud, they also decided they wanted to use Jitterbit to go a step further and completely transition their infrastructure to the cloud. So today, they use Jitterbit to manage all data exchange between their claims processing application and client eligibility system with Salesforce. They also integrate Amazon.com web services to archive data. Essentially, AWPRX began by using Jitterbit on-premise, acting as sort of a cloud on-ramp, and then moving their entire business piece by piece into the cloud while keeping all of these pieces integrated. And today, they use Jitterbit for ongoing real-time integration between various Force.com apps, Amazon Web Services, and other cloud systems. And Jitterbit itself is also deployed in the cloud within this infrastructure. So while we don't expect many companies' infrastructure to end up looking like that of AWPRX, their story is interesting because it shows how Jitterbit can be used within an on-premise, hybrid, and fully cloud environment. Um, and these guys just happen to have run it in all three environments in about the past year and a half. So this is just one of you know, hundreds of customer success stories that we could go through. Um, and they range from enterprises like Continental Airlines um, to others such as the state of Iowa. Um, but given the amount of time we have here today, I'm going to skip over these for now. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about a specific customer, you can find more of these on our website at jitterbit.com. You can also contact us at info at jitterbit.com, 
and just ask us for a case study for any customer and we'd be happy uh, to share that with you. So moving towards the demo, as you probably noticed when you signed up for this webinar, we did ask what systems you were interested in integrating. Um, and as we expected, the responses were very varied. Um, so again, we can only show so much in the allotted time that we have. So what we decided to do was do a, a live demo of the most requested application, which maybe not surprisingly was the Salesforce CRM uh, SaaS application. So um, Dave, I'm going to hand things over to you. Um, and I would just note that what you see here, um, the experience you see with Jitterbit, um, even though we are connecting to Salesforce today, the experience would be very similar connecting to any other web service, any other cloud application, and in fact, any other on-premise application. So Dave, I'll uh, let you take over from here. Yeah, great. So before I jump right into the demo, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the, the Jitterbit integration environment here in the user interface and just explain to you some of the concepts that, that we use. So really the heart of what um, you'll see today is you know, what we do is, is what's called an operation, and that's basically what do you want to do. I want to move data from SQL Server to Salesforce. I want to take data from Salesforce and pump it out to flat files. I want to take a flat file from Salesforce and put it in FTP. So those operations are actually graphical operations you'll see today. Uh, after I build one and connect you, we'll actually walk through and take a look at what was generated. Transformations are, okay, now I know where I want to take the data from and put it, but what if I want to do some transformation rules before I move that data? Maybe I want to convert a string to uppercase or convert something to an integer or do a database lookup somewhere to see if this is a valid value um, that maybe that I, before I do the actual insert into the database or the upsert into to Salesforce. Sources and targets. Pretty obvious um, today, you'll see me, I'm actually going to be working with SQL Server and um, Salesforce, but sources can really be anything you can think of. You can see I'm just using the NodeDBC driver here to, to hit SQL Server, but you can see all the other different types of things you can get to here. Uh, one that's not listed here is EDI, so we also do EDI integration. And then um, targets, again, just the reverse of a source. You just define where you want the data to go. Web service methods, you're going to see today that those are actually going to get invoked using the Apex API provided by Salesforce. However, I don't really need to know anything about them um, in order to use them, and that's that's really the whole point of Jitterbit Connect. HTTP endpoints allow you to actually make external calls to operations from, from uh, applications like Salesforce. So if I had a workflow uh, rule that kicked off every time my lead went to close one or an opportunity, I could fire off an operation in real time inside of Jitterbit from an external program. Text structures, again, if I want to move flat files in, we can handle common delimited string files, uh, complex hierarchical files, what have you. And that's a pretty common integration for us across our customer base. Schedules, schedules effectively are set up to fire off operations on, say you want to fire off an operation every Friday at 2 p.m., you just put it on the schedule or every minute or every second or every Wednesday at 5. So that's what you do with the schedulers. Email messages can be sent when operations either succeed or fail. There will be times when a system may be down and you want to know about that. And so you can just define an email message to send it to a group of people or individuals. Scripts are ways of invoking our formula builder because there are some complex things you may need to do during a transformation. Maybe I have to see if the last 12 characters are equal to this before I can put the data in. So we have a macro-based language called Formula Builder. So if you know Excel, you, you, you could use this language, and it's all well documented, and it's not meant for programmers. It's meant for business people. And then finally, Jitterbit Connect is what we're going to take a look at, which is what we call our wizards um, for doing uh, integration to Salesforce. So the scenario I'd like to show you today is I have a SQL Server database over here, with, real simple, with a, with a table called Customer that doesn't have any data in it. And so what I want to do is go up and do a query on Salesforce, and I have uh, development environment at Salesforce here. You can see now a tremendous amount of accounts, but I have my 14 accounts. So I'm going to bring those back down into the, into SQL Server, and then we'll make a change in SQL Server, and we'll go the reverse. So let's get started. So the first thing I'll do is define my new Salesforce query, and you can see that I'm using the Enterprise WSDL here. We also support the Partner WSDL as well. Uh, I like to use the Enterprise WSDL because it's just more powerful. So I've generated the WSDL from my um, dev instance and brought it back down to my desktop here. You see it's already had my endpoint defined, my credentials, and my security tokens since I'm using the dev environment. 
And I'll just go next here in the wizard. Now you can see when introspected the Salesforce Wizzle and came back with all the different Salesforce objects that are inside the system here. So if I want, you know, I can do things like this just to filter things out. And I can also expand and see all the different fields that are actually in the accounts object here. So you'll notice, too, that we built this so you don't have to type anything and you don't really need to know the SQL language itself. I know that, that I'm interested in the account object, so I'm going to insert that. Now I'm going to go through and pick the fields that I want to actually bring back. And we'll just say billing city, postal code, state, street, uh, ID, the name of the account, and then finally the site. And then I just take and drag and drop that up here. And you can see that it built my SQL statement for me. So we'll move on to the next step here. And it's asking me what my target's going to be. Well, my target's going to be the SQL Server database that I just showed you. So I'm just going to push next. And it's going to say, which tables do you want to use inside of that database? Well, I only have one. So we'll just pick it, the customer. I'm going to use it one time. It already knows that I have a key to find here. If I didn't have a key to find on my SQL Server table, I can also define those keys within Jitterbit for temporary use, which is a nice little feature. But we've already got one, so we'll just move on. Now it's asking me, you know, what do you want to call this? I'm just going to let it call it Query Account, I'm summarizing what it's going to build. And it's asking me if I want to use the Auto Mapper. And Auto Mapper basically matches like name. So if I have name in SQL Server, name in, in the Accounts table, or an Accounts object, then it's going to make that mapping for me. So we'll go ahead and do that. And now you're actually seeing the transformation piece of the product. And you can see it's already mapped uh, the field that it could map to SQL Server from Account. And it only brought back the objects that I wanted to see, too. I mean, it's a feature to turn that back on. But this is nice, too, because there's a lot of different fields in account. And if you're, not, if you're not using them, then there's a point to showing them. So it didn't match postal code, because I didn't even bring that down. I don't have that defined in SQL Server. That's fine. But Filling Street, I know, is address in my SQL Server table. So now I've done my mapping. And if I want to, I can go and test this web service call. And the reason we have the test feature is you, you may want to look and see where the data actually mapped to before you push it to SQL Server in this case. And this just allows you to you know, do some manipulation. Maybe you say, oh, gee, I need, I need to convert that to uppercase, or I've mapped one field to the wrong field. So what's happening now is it's actually pushing and deploying out the metadata. I have my 14 accounts over here. I can flip through them on the Salesforce side. And I can also go to the other side and look and see that, yeah, in fact, everything looks like it came across, like name, that's, that's communication. So I'm, if I'm happy with this and I don't want to do any manipulation, I'll just go ahead and invoke this operation. So what got generated from that wizard is what we call, again, an operation. And you can see it's just a, a logical flow. The first thing it does is it has to log into Salesforce, which is sort of a process in itself when you're dealing with the Apex ABI, so it just makes it a little easier. Um, and I'm going out and querying the account. That's the SOAP request. And I'm actually calling the Salesforce query method. Then I'm building the response and then ultimately mapping it to SQL Server. So now what we'll do, instead of putting this on the scheduler, I'll just go ahead and run this in real time. And you can see down here that it's putting this operation in the queue. You know, you probably have multiple operations in here on a daily basis. And you have a whole set of administration functions that we won't go in today to be able to see what's actually happened on the server at any given time. And you can see it completed in seven seconds, and it gave me a successful message, which is always good in a demo. And now we'll go out to SQL Server, and we'll actually run a select statement. And you can see that I got those 14 accounts back from Salesforce with just a few clicks. So let's take one. Let's look here. Grand Hotels and Resorts. Let's go up and look. And right now, Grand Hotels and Resorts doesn't have an account site. So let's put one in, and let's turn around and do the reverse operation of an upsert to Salesforce. So we'll just go in here for Grand Hotels, and we'll just call it Downtown. So we'll make the update in SQL, go back to Jitterbit, close the stuff. And now we'll do the reverse operation, which is called an upsert. Just define it using the same WSDL, same process again, same credentials. Ask me which objects I want to update. I want to update the account object. I need to pick a unique identifier, which is the ID field and object and the account object. And now it's asking my source. It's going to be a database. It's going to be the SQL Server, uh, same database on, on the reverse. 
once again, where do you want to pull the data from? I want to pull it from the customer table. If I wanted to, I could do a where clause here and say only give me the ones in you know, this state. But since we only have 14, we'll just take them all. And then, once again, it's giving me a summary of what it's going to do here. And I'm just going to leave it at the default. And once again, come up with our transformation map. Address didn't come over, but I know that that goes to street because it's a different name. And we'll just go ahead and run this. We could do some testing over here, but I feel fairly confident that this should work. And you can see, once again, just the flow in reverse here. It's a graphical model, so you can see what's going on from a workflow perspective. We'll run this operation. And once again, deploying this out to the server. Nothing happens on the client. Just it's just where you build your operations and do your transformations. All the work is done out on the server. And the server can run on Linux, Windows, or uh, Solaris. And you can see it's pushing it out to operations queue again. Should complete here in a couple of seconds. And put back over to Salesforce. And we got a successful message. Once again, that's good. And we'll go back to our accounts. And we'll take a look at Grand Hotels and Resorts. And you can see now that the account site is set to downtown. So it's really that simple. OK, Dave, so we've got some uh, questions here from the audience. So I think what we'll do is I'll moderate, um, ask you the questions, and then we'll kind of move through as many as we can um, in the time we've got left. And any questions that we don't get answered um, in this time during the webinar, we will um, get back to everyone individually. So Dave, the first question here uh, goes back to something we were sort of talking about in the presentation, but the question is, uh, do we use adapters to connect to Salesforce? No, we do not. We uh, don't use adapters to connect to any of the systems that we integrate with. We are all standards-based. In the case of Salesforce, it's web services. You know, in the case of standard databases, it's going to be OBC, JDBC, et cetera. Gotcha. Okay. Next question we've got here is, uh, how frequently do you upgrade and what are the impacts of um, upgrading to existing integration interfaces? Well, we do one to two minor releases a year, and we do point releases as needed in between those major releases. Uh, as far as impacting you know, upgrading to new releases, all of our data that's stored in, in our XML format in our local metadata store so we're not going to walk over anything that you've already done. We're just going to basically update that database when you come from one client to the next to the new version and just upload the new stuff. So you're not going to lose anything from a migration standpoint. OK, next question here. Uh, is there a limit uh, on how many data sources that you can integrate with Jitterbit? No, once you purchase a server license from Jitterbit, we do not have limitations on how many connections you can make, whether you're going to Salesforce, or Oracle, or maybe SAP down the line. We don't have an additional charge per connection. We don't charge by CPU. So basically, it's an all-you-can-eat menu. Once you purchase a license, you can integrate to as many systems as you'd like. OK. And speaking of sources, um, can you talk a little more specific about uh, what type of EDI sources, um, and I guess targets as well, that we support? We can support any ANSI or EDIFAC-based EDI form. So you just need to tell us when you make a purchase what version, in addition to the type. So if you want an 850, you need to tell us whether you want the 4010 or the 2010 or what have you. So we can support any, any um, standard EDI format that's out there. OK, do you support? Um, test or staging environments along with production? Yes. Um, we, most of our customers, and I guess probably all of them, uh, use our product in that manner. So certainly point uh, your operations once they're defined, your connectivity once it's defined, between, you can flip that between a test and a production environment. Very common scenario for us. OK, next question here is, uh, do, do we support uh, user and groups and permissions for those users and groups? Yes, every object inside of Jitterbit uh, 
can have a permission structure associated with it. So whether that's from an individual or a group or a, anyone in that group that has those permissions. So that's, a, again, a standard feature in the administration console. And that's available uh, both in the enterprise and the MX version of the product. Okay, and a follow-up question to that is uh, we talked a lot about both developers and business analysts being able to work with Jitterbit. Is there a way that two or more people can work on a project at the same time? Yes. If you purchase the MX edition, Enterprise MX, you can have multiple people interacting on a project within Jitterbit. Okay. Um, the next question is uh, referring to some of the limitations I mentioned in the presentation around web services. Can you talk a little more specifically about how you deal with um, like web service call limitations and uh, size limitations? Well, a good example would be with Salesforce when you do an upsert, you're only allowed to send 200 records at a time. And that's fine if you're doing real small uh, you know, updates to, to Salesforce, but if you're going to do things on a larger scale, what we do to come around that, that actual limitation is we created something called database chunking. And what chunking does is allow you to spawn multiple threads across your CPU. So, for instance, if I have 10 CPUs and I can spawn you know, 200 records at a time, then you know, I'm getting 10 times the throughput um, that I normally would get with a limitation inside of the web services API from Salesforce. So those are some of the things we do to make the product perform better. Okay, the next question here is about data federation. How um, how does Jitterbit work with data federation as opposed to data consolidation? Well, it's really just the opposite. You can take um, a single source. I showed you SQL Server today. And I could take and push some of that data from SQL Server to Salesforce. I could take other portions and push it into Oracle or Flatfile or what have you. So it's really just the reverse of the data consolidation. There's no, no, no real difference in how you do things just going the other direction. Okay, and then the uh, question here is, can other applications interface with Jitterbit? Sure. Um, certainly we support a lot of the enterprise applications that are out there, but if, you, if you're referring to the fact that you want to actually, maybe you've written a .NET application or something in C-sharp and you want to actually call a Jitterbit operation based on an event or a trigger that happens, um, all of those operations that I showed you earlier today are exposed via web services, so if an event kicks off, I can go ahead and call that operation in real time. So, again, we're just an open-based standards. We, we use web services, so there's no you know, blocking of anything. That, you know, If you want to call something externally, you can certainly do that. Okay, and then maybe a bit of a follow-up question here, and I think we'll make this the last question um, since we're running short on time. So I know there's other questions out there. We will get those answered. Um, but, Dave, the last question here is... Um, Plugins, let's see, plugins, can they be written or are they written, are they already written for Jitterbit? So I guess the question is, uh, can people write their own plugins for Jitterbit? Yes. Um, all you need to do is, you know, figure out uh, what you want to do as far as inputs and outputs, and we can support Java or C Sharp, C, etc. cetera. Um, basically, the plugins themselves are, we can create them for you, but you should certainly do them yourself, and we have a sort of a mixed bag. Um, if you go out on the wiki, uh, wiki Jitterbit plugins, it'll show you exactly how to create one. And then it's just a matter of applying that plugin to your source or target at the time of transformation. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Dave. I think we're going to wrap up here. Um, like I said, we will get everyone's questions answered for those that we didn't get to today. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, if you have any questions that come up after the fact here, uh, please email us at info at jitterbit.com. Um, Dave, thanks for the demo, and thanks Great. everyone else for joining us. Thanks a lot.